postdoc will be given by Emil Mathieu, who is currently a postdoc uh, in Cambridge. Take it away. Okay. Thanks, uh, thanks Marilu, for uh, the introduction. I guess the invite, so indeed I'm a postdoc in, in Cambridge, and so I'll talk about geometric neural diffusion processes, uh, where we basically propose a probabilistic model uh, for modeling tensor fields and feature fields. And I guess I'll give more motivation and details in what follows. And so, the, so this is joint work with uh, Vincent uh, Dutortois, Michael Hutchinson, Valentin de Bortili, Iwaite, and Rich Donner. So I guess my old collaborators, either in Cambridge or Oxford or in, in Paris. So first I'll have like a very brief uh, intro to generative modeling, I guess to like try to motivate why do we care about this kind of like probabilistic setting. Uh, then some background on continuous diffusion models, although I guess uh, quite a lot of that material, I guess, uh, has already been um, introduced in the previous talk. And then um, I'll show how we can kind of uh, extend that setting to uh, the function space in order to model stochastic processes. And, and um, eventually how to model feature fields, so how to kind of incorporate uh, geometric uh, kind of constraints into the model. So first on like deep generative modeling, so there's like quite some settings where we kind of like truly care about this kind of probabilistic modeling and not just like a deterministic guess. So one is in molecular conformation generation where, uh, you know, say you have like access to a molecular, molecular graph and you'd like to predict the 3D structure of that molecule. And so you could kind of just have like, you know, a neural network, graph neural network that takes that as input in up to a 3D structure. But because of like temperature uh, fluctuations, this 3D structure is actually not like fully frozen, it kind of like fluctuates. And also depending on the specific uh, choice of molecule, there might be like different kind of metastable uh, structure in which this molecule kind of like could be. So it wouldn't, doesn't really make any sense to like kind of make one guess because actually there's like a full distribution over the 3D space of, you know, each of the atoms. So here's kind of like intrinsically, you know, random, so you'd like your model to, uh, you know, model and incorporate that, that uh, randomness. Uh, another one would be, uh, for instance, in meteorology, uh, in, you know, let's say you like to predict like precipitation in the following like hours or days or even weeks, and that's actually like extremely tricky. Um, I mean, I guess I'm not a physician myself, but having talked with like uh, atmospheric physicians, it seems like like the physics is kind of like still like not fully well understood, and it's it's almost I think also like quite chaotic. So a small like change in the initial condition uh, would you know would tell you that it's going to rain here, but actually not rain like you know 500 meters away. And so here it's more like the kind of like the lack of, of knowledge. Uh, you know, due to the, the lack of, of understanding of the physics, but also of data that would, you know, make us like incorporate that, you know, a, a lack of, uh, you know, lack of, you know, good prediction, the essentiality into the modeling so that we kind of know, you know, how much we actually don't know. So instead of predicting like, you know, how much, uh, you know, precipitation there'll be, we'll have like a full distribution of, a, of a, uh, you know, the precipitation. So I guess this like in a different perfectly where we kind of like, there's some interesting randomness and the second example where it's more like uh, we want to introduce uncertainty in the modeling to capture or kind of like, you know, limited knowledge about the problem. Uh, and so deep generative models are basically like neural network kind of based uh, model that parameterize a, a probability distribution. And so the idea is that, you know, we'd like to be able to uh, either or both draw samples from the distribution uh, or also, you know, evaluate the likelihood of some kind of samples under that model. And we kind of typically assume that we're going to have access to, uh, to samples from a digital distribution, you know, some kind of data set that we have access to. And because in the setting where we, we have access to some kind of like anomalous density or some kind of energy, uh, usually people refer to that as like a sampling problem. And most of, um, I guess, like following the previous talk, uh, most of probabilistic models we kind of uh, follow into this uh, kind of like quite high level uh, uh, framework where one would start with some kind of distribution. So for instance, a normal or either something that's like uh, a checkerboard, checkerboard. And the idea is to have a parametric transformation to push forward uh, that density along that, that transformation. And that would induce uh, another distribution that's like potentially like quite more complex. And then the idea is to like tune and learn the parameters of that transformation so that the induced uh, probability distribution would kind of like fit, um, you know, would be like pretty close to a data distribution that you'd like to, to fit, like the data distribution that you care about. And once you've done that, you can generate new samples or evaluate uh, any, you know, the likelihood of your model 
uh, for like if you give a new sample. So that's kind of the general framework. And diffusion models like do indeed fit into I guess the setting. And as that reminded previously, they're like uh, they're like they've been shown to work extremely well in practice. And so that's why we kind of in this in this uh, talk uh, build on this class of model. So I guess there's some overlap, but still like I'll give a brief uh, background on continuous diffusion model. So the, the, the key idea is really to start with some kind of like, uh, you know, data samples. So, so we call, so I guess different, <laughs> slight difference with the previous talk is that I, the time is kind of like inverse. So we'd say like the initial data distribution, uh, you know, so the samples would come from like y is zero, so t equals zero. And then we like noise them until we get to like some kind of like base or limiting distribution at t equals one. So that's kind of just a small uh, caveat. And so the idea is to construct, you know, to destruct the data with a continuous uh, series of noise. And this would be formalized by, uh, by a stochastic differential <coughs> equations, which, we, which you know, people like, have introduced as like, uh, the four noising process because you like, continuously noise and destroy uh, data samples until so, like, you know, time uh, capital T. And the, the idea, right, is that that would converge to a known distribution, such as like uh, a Gaussian. And then the core idea of diffusion models is like, oh, but you know, since we have this forward noising process going from like, you know, the data distribution to a known distribution, can we uh, you know, simulate from the time reversal starting from like uh, this known data distribution to samples that are like distributed accordingly to the, the data distribution that we care about. So in here in equation one, have like kind of like a you know, white class of uh, SDEs with a drift term. Uh, in B and like a you know, volatility or, or, or diffusion uh, coefficient uh, in sigma. And in question two, we have a specific type referred as like the uh, Langevin uh, dynamics. And what's kind of nice uh, here uh, is that the Langevin dynamics admits as like an environment measure, something that's proportional to exponential minus uh, U with U, you know, I guess being some kind of like energy potential. And so you can kind of choose U so that you know towards what this uh, stochastic process is gonna converge. Uh, and so if we take like a specific example of uh, B just being zero, so you know, if, if you use like constant, then B is gonna be zero, then you just have simply this like brain motion term, um, and then the environment measure would just be the, the Lebesgue. And another kind of like, indeed like very well studied example is the Ashton and Lebesgue process where the drift is linear in the, uh, in the variable uh, here, yt. And here, if you choose kind of the coefficient wide, uh, wisely, then you, the environment measure would be a standard normal uh, with yeah, mean zero and, and variance one. And what's kind of quite nice is that conditional like a data sample y zero, for any time t, we, we, we explicitly know the form of the conditional y t given y zero, and it is Gaussian. And with mean and parameters, uh, depending on like y zero and you know, the value of the noising time t. Um, and so I guess I kind of didn't put that slide, but uh, for people who are more familiar with like, like discrete uh, diffusion models, you can see them as like a discretization of, the, of these SDs and kind of vice versa. So they're kind of uh, rated in, in this way. Uh, yeah, so it, like feel free to interpret if there's like any question or something uh, that's unclear or, or some remarks. Also, I'll, give some, I'll leave some time at the end for that, but you know, uh, yeah, if there's anything. So is that relatively clear? Okay, so then uh, what's nice, so what we care about is this time reversal, you know, when we throw up the time index, like, you know, what, what is the dynamic of that process? And what's uh, nice is that under, like, very mild assumption, uh, it has been shown that this time reversal also satisfies an SDs that has, like, a pretty similar form, uh, which is given here, where the diffusion term sigma is the sum. The only difference is in the drift. And so where you have uh, kind of, like, the opposite of the forward drift, of the noising process drift. So you can see that, you know, if sigma is zero, basically there's just like the time reversal of an OD. But here, since we have some noise sigma, then you have this extra term in yellow, uh, which is referred as the sign score. And I guess intuitively, right, so here PT being like the density of the forward process. So intuitively that tells you, you know, what is the kind of the direction of, uh, of you know, the, the, of the, the density at time zero, uh, at time T, sorry. And so it kind of tells you, you know, where in some way uh, you would like to go in order to get closer to the data manifold, especially as t uh, gets close to zero. 
So that gives us like a recipe like how to, you know, to build a generative model uh, by, you know, starting with some uh, YT bar, so y, y, uh, sorry, Y0 bar, so being the kind of initial uh, value of the time reversal, so kind of the last value, the end value of the, uh, of the forward process. And then if you were to be able to simulate that, then you at time, you know, t equal uh, one, you'll get samples that are distributed according to the data process, which is what, what you know, that's kind of the aim. Uh, I guess there's, uh, you know, obviously a, a few kind of like issues which prevents us from doing that. The first one, uh, as mentioned earlier, is that actually we don't have access, you know, to Y capital T, which is kind of the end time of the, the diffusion. Uh, we have access to like, you know, Y capital T given some, you know, specific uh, Y zero, but not to the marginal. But so I guess the idea is that, you know, if you run T uh, long enough, and indeed specifically if you use like, uh, like Langevin dynamics, uh, this would converge with like geometric rate. So actually it converges like pretty quickly. So it would be approximate, but you know, it can be like relatively close to actually start with this, uh, you know, environment limiting distribution. Then uh, the other kind of issue, uh, maybe the main one, is that we don't, we don't have access to the science score because it would involve so, uh, so like focal Planck, and so we, we don't want to go through that, uh, through that um, uh, avenue. So the idea is to learn it, and that's what, we, uh, that's what I'm gonna show in the next slide, how to do that. And I guess the, um, the last issue is like, even if we were to know the science score, a part if it has like a very simple functional form like you know, linear in, in YT, then there's no way we're gonna be able to solve that uh, that uh, SD in closed form. And so the idea then is you need to like discretize it. Um, yeah, so how to indeed like approximate the score. So there's like kind of like a pretty simple uh, score matching identity that's been shown, uh, which involves just like, you know, derivative of the log and then just using the fact that the uh, you know, marginal is the integral of the joint and, and, and base rule. And you can show equation three. And what's nice is that it, the right hand side of question three is a conditional expectation with the integral being the, the first term. And so uh, that tells you that the, the left hand side of the equation is the uh, minimizer of that following, uh, you know, a, a, like quadratic optimization, optimization problem over the functional S. Uh, and so, so that kind of readily gives us a, you know, a loss uh, uh, to, you know, to use in order to uh, approximate uh, the Stein score S. And so the idea is to use a neural network uh, with some you know, finite number of parameters theta, and to uh, plug our score network in equation four, which is called the denoising score matching loss. Um, and since we you know, we know what is y t given y zero, we have that in close form, can both compute this conditional score, but we can also uh, you know, some, you know, approximate this expectation with like a Monte Carlo estimator. And so finally, uh, we would, you know, this SD wouldn't be you know, plugging the uh, score network instead of the true uh, Stein score, uh, then you know, one could rely on like a first order discretization scheme, for instance, in order to approximate that uh, SD. And then starting with like the, you know, here for instance, like white noise, so Gaussian noise on each of the pixel, and then uh, using this euler mariama scheme in order to approximate, simulate the time reversal, uh, one could sample, uh, you know, obtain sample, uh, that are approximately distributed according to the uh, data distribution. Okay, so the idea of continuous diffusion models, like a quick recap, is I guess like you know, two things. One is to build, construct a, a noising process that's formalized with like an SD in order to continually destruct the, the data sample and then to approximate the time reversal uh, process. Okay, so is there, yeah, is there any question on that part? Because I guess then I'm gonna build on that, so. Okay, so now I'd like to, I guess, introduce uh, the, diving into the, uh, the method that we, we propose, this probabilistic model of a, a feature field. And so that's, that's kind of the, the aim of, uh, of this talk. And so, like briefly, and I'm gonna mention that introduce that a bit more for formalizer just after. Like tensor fields are like mappings from like an input space to a tensor and tensors are like geometric objects that uh, transform in a particular when the, the coordinates change. So you could think of like nuclear space like a rotation or translation of your frame. And we'd like also to enforce invariance uh, for such objects uh, over with respect to group transformation. 
And we kind of achieve, achieve this in two ways. First, by extending different models to the uh, to function space by correlating the uh, finite marginals for different inputs. And then by enforcing uh, invariants, indeed, using a kernel and a score network, which are a group equivalent. So I'll, I'll go more in details uh, how we do so in practice. So a few examples first uh, to motivate, like, why do we care about feature fields? In, in the natural sciences, there's, like, many problems where the kind of, like, objects of interest of study are, uh, are feature fields. So one can think of, like, uh, like a skis, you know, in uh, oceanography, where the salinity is, like, a scalar field, or, you know, current is, like, a 2D or 3D uh, vector field, but also, like, the uh, vorticity, uh, you know, in the atmosphere being, like, a, a pseudo-vector field, which is slightly different. Uh, but also in mechanics with, like, uh, for instance, a high-dimensional rank 2 uh, strength tensor, uh, which is also like a tensor, just uh, an object's, like, high-dimensional. And so, uh, more rigorously, so a feature field uh, can be seen as, like, a tuple with, uh, first, a mapping F, uh, you know, mapping some input to, like, some output space, which we assume to be Euclidean here, and some uh, representation row, which kind of tells you, like, what type this uh, feature, this, like, tensor is. Uh, that is mapping from like a group element to a linear transformation uh, here over RD. And so focusing on like the Euclidean setting, if when the group uh, being like the Euclidean group, which is like all the other matrices of the Euclidean space, so think like uh, in the like translation and, and rotation. Uh, and so then acting, transforming a feature field with some group element G on F of X, so the feature field F, with you know G being like uh, U, a translation composed with a rotation H, then it's gonna be, it's gonna transform the field as given by the right-hand side of equation five, which is that first, uh, I guess if you look at like the top left uh, picture, this is the original feature field. Then you would kind of like look at the value of your feature field at g minus one of x. And then you would uh, update, you transform that feature field according to rho of h. And here rho depends on the specific types of field that you're like interested in modeling. So for a scalar field, a row would just be one, so actually you wouldn't change anything, so that's why the middle and right-hand side plots are kind of exactly the same in terms of the, the colors. But if you look at like the, uh, the black arrows, so that's like a, a 2D vector field, then you would additionally, row would be, uh, row of H would be H, would be the identity mapping. So you would add, additionally need to like rotate these arrows. And that kind of, you know, concept of, of uh, representations, I kind of generalize to like higher dimensional uh, tensors, you know, higher dimensional than like vector field, for instance, this uh, stress tensor in, in mechanics. And so what, what we want to do is like to build a probabilistic model over such objects. And so first, uh, I'll show how we can extend uh, different models to the function space. And so the idea is to basically, if we look at like different uh, value of our functions at, at different inputs, uh, x1 to xn, so we have n such values, is to noise all of these values like jointly with a kernel uh, that's given by hey k. And so then you have like, for instance, like a multivite Austrian and back process um, that are noising each of these values with this, this kernel k. And so that's why you have this gram matrix uh, k of x, x in front of the Brownian motion. And what's nice is that, so I guess this is similar to kind of the finite setting because you're only looking at like a finite number of inputs uh, x1 to xn, so you know that this uh, process will converge to a, to a multivariate normal, which mean and covariance are given by uh, uh, m and k. And we show that basically since this is true for any finite marginals, in practice this is building a, a diffusion model of a function space. And so the uh, process will converge to a Gaussian process with mean and, co and kernel given by arches of m and k. And so you can see yt as like interpolating, in, you know, between stochastic processes, y0 being like the data process that you're trying to model, and y infinity being the, uh, the kind of this, this GP uh, at the kind of infinite time limit. And same here, everything is kind of like available in close sum, everything's Gaussian, so uh, that's, that's very convenient for training purposes. And so depending on the specific choice of kernel, uh, then the process will converge to different GPs, uh, here with like, you know, a smaller length scale, and I guess, you know, in the infinitely small uh, length scale, um, then you would converge to white noise. So I guess here you actually uh, noise each of the uh, uh, y, x, k independently. Can, can yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's like a, a modeling choice, I guess. Okay. Depending on you know what you may know about the, the data process. Okay. Uh, and I guess same with the mean, but I guess you would typically assume just zero or constant. Okay. Yeah, so that's like um, yeah, so that's like up to you. Um, and so, yeah, kind of, uh, then we similarly have like a time reversal process, and the only difference uh, is that we have this like gram matrix k in front of the skull, uh, but otherwise, you know, it's kind of like the, the, same, the same ideas in the, uh, as previously. And that time reversal, we like, you know, converge, uh, you know, we start with a GP, so y zero bar is being the GP, and then the idea is to simulate the time reversal so that at, uh, uh, y bar uh, capital T, then we, we have, you know, sample paths that are distributed according to our data process, y0. And so we don't have access similarly to the Stein score, so we have to approximate it. And since we have, you know, the Stein score is preconditioned by this gram matrix, we kind of suggest to directly learn this with the neural network. And same, the, uh, the uh, uh, conditional yt given y0 is available uh, in closed form. And so what you know, we also use this denoising score matching loss, and we kind of use a, a weighting uh, that involves this gram matrix, so that it's kind of multiplying both, uh, you know, both terms of inside this quadratic term with k, so that then we have like k uh, times the score that appears, and we can directly approximate this with the neural network. And then also on the right hand side, it's nice because we don't have any like k inverse, we just have like, I guess we have like a, a Cholesky decomposition to do. And that's, that's the training loss that we actually use. Okay, so yeah, is there, is there any questions so far on this? Okay, so now I'll go into like the invariant uh, kind of constraint that we'd like to enforce in our neural diffusion process. And so uh, I guess a stochastic process, F that comes from a priority measure mu, uh, is said to be gene invariant if the, the measure itself is gene invariant. And so maybe in terms of like sample, it's easier to, to understand, is that if you have some like input pairs uh, you know, x and f of x, um, and then you have like this, you transform the same uh, set with a group element g, um, then those two sets would have the same distribution if uh, the uh, stochastic process is gene invariant. So that's, that's the definition. So you can think of like in 1D, if you have like, uh, you know, samples, uh, sample path, then if you just kind of like translate uh, that uh, entire distribution, uh, then if uh, f is translation variant, which is often referred as like is, is stationary, then the sample paths will have the same distribution. And so that's kind of the property that we like to enforce in our model. And one, one specific and kind of like simple example of this is an invariant GP. And as I have been shown, that like a GP is basically G invariant if and only if the mean and the kernel are G equivalent, defined as uh, in equation nine. And so that implies that basically the mean is, is a constant. And for the kernel, it's kind of like a bit trickier and like, so I'm giving some example in the Euclidean setting. So you can, the simplest idea is just to take k being like k0 times some identity matrix and k0 being group invariant. So for, uh, uh, for the Euclidean group, you can think of like, you know, like the LBF or the Matten kernel, for instance. Um, but there have been like suggested like more interesting, and so I guess this diagonal kernel, you can see it as like here the x and y component on the left hand and side being independent GPs. So I guess you have two kind of scalar GPs. Um, but you can also ha use like you know, kind of more interesting kernels, um, uh, which would lead to the uh, you know sample vector fields on the middle and the right hand side, which have zero uh, divergence and zero uh, curls. And so this satisfies this uh, G covariant uh, constraint, and so they, they lead to like G invariant uh, GPs. So I guess what what we like from here is like how can we uh, enforce that group invariant? Uh, invariant constraints into our generative model of a uh, you know, function space. And so what we show is that you need kind of two things. So you need to indeed target, you know, have as this limiting uh, process uh, a group invariant GP. And so as, as just shown, uh, you can do that by having a group equivalent mean and kernel. And then the other constraint is for the skull network to be also group uh, equivalent. And so that can be done since we, we are like parameterizing the skull network with like a neural network, we can basically choose the specific neural architecture to enforce that. And so depending on the type of, of field that we're modeling, you know, like a scalar field, 
uh, you know, that we want to be translation variant or uh, you know, vector field or even high dimensional objects, we can just choose a neural architecture that uh, enforces this group equivalent with respect to this type of, of field. Um, and so here is like a bit of an uh, illustration of, of what that means in practice in terms of some samples. So on the most left um, hand side kind of column, uh, we have samples from this uh, uh, you know, invariant uh, GP. Uh, so this is what we start. And this is like kind of our, our white noise. And here we, we have like a, uh, an RBF kernel. And in the bottom row, this is basically the sample that's above, but that is transformed by a 90 degree rotation. And then uh, the geometry model you know, applies this denoising uh, scheme um, by approximating the time reversal with a score network that is, uh, that is here E2 equivalent. And so what you have when it is fully denoised at time equal one uh, is that the sample uh, at the bottom is still the uh, 90 degree uh, rotation transform sample uh, at the above. And so that's because both samples have the same uh, distribution. They kind of the same apart from this like uh, 90 degree uh, transformation. And so I guess in practice this is nice. We should like this group environment over like kind of stochastic processes. But in practice, what we are like, often interested in is more like the, in the conditional setting, you know. If we have access to like some set of observation and we like to be able, you know, conditioning on this observation, you know, to sample from the conditional process. Uh, you know, it could be for like, I guess that's the previous example from like weather forecast, you like have some data from like, you know, weather stations, but then you might like to know the precipitation, like different space time kind of points. Uh, and so then the property that's like kind of more of interest is this more like group equivalence, which is given here, which is like, you know, if you were to uh, transform your context set, the, the set you're like conditioning in, uh, you'd like your uh, conditional process to also be transformed in a similar way. Uh, and so I guess here there's like an illustration in figure five for like a 1D uh, uh, kind of scalar fields example. If you translate the three uh, red dots, which, which we are conditioning on uh, by like two, then the conditional process will similarly be transformed. So all the sample path uh, in blue are you know, also translated from the left uh, to the right. And then you know, another example on the right with like a 2D vector field where similarly the, trans the transformation is like a 90 degree uh, rotation. So the context sets being like here, like these red arrows, and then you know, we're like uh, transforming the context sets by like a 90 degree rotations, and then the conditional uh, process is similarly uh, uh, transformed. And so then the question would be like, how can we, you know, how does this, uh, you know, is enforced? Uh, can, how can we enforce this similarly to this, uh, you know, gene variance uh, of the you know, unconditional process? And basically what can be shown is that uh, there's kind of two sides of the same coins. They are actually the, the, the same thing. So if your uh, stochastic process is gene variant, then this uh, conditional process is going to be gene coined. So it's kind of like it comes for free. Um, so, and we've shown how to, uh, how to enforce our, our stochastic process to be gene variant by having like a G-covariant kernel and a G-covariant uh, score network. So then in practice, we'd like to be able to get samples from that, uh, uh, you know, given like a context set. So we, we're calling up the context set C and, you know, given some like query uh, points that we're interested in like X stars, we'd be able to, to sample those like Y stars. Um, and so there, there have been proposed um, uh, in, in, in the literature by, um, in this paper by Brian Tripp and uh, Al, uh, kind of like a relatively, uh, and I guess also by uh, Yan Tong, relatively like simple scheme, uh, which, uh, which involves kind of two things. One being to uh, noise the context so that what we are, you know, YC, what we want to condition on, until, uh, you know, this level of, of noise T that we are looking at at the moment. And then, then we apply like a denoising step uh, you know, with like some uh, discretization step gamma on both the context YC and the variable we're interested Y star. And then the idea is just to repeat this until you like kind of fully denoise uh, your, your samples and then your, uh, uh, what can be shown is that as gamma tends to zero or with like an SMC corrective uh, step, you have samples that are like kind of exactly uh, uh, distributed according to the conditional process. But what we've observed in practice is that you really need gamma to be extremely small. And I guess the smaller gamma is, the more steps you're taking and so the more like calls to your neural network you have, which is obviously uh, that's kind of like the, 
the consumption cost that, that you know it scales linear, linearly, and so you like to keep uh, gamma pretty pretty uh, large as large as you, as you can. Uh, and because if gamma is like not small enough, then basically empirically this would tend to dismiss the context so to sample from the unconditional process. And so in the literature by uh, Sugumar et al. in this repaint algorithm, uh, which is kind of like this because it was looking at like image and painting, so you know you, you like hide part of an image and you like sample from from, from that. Uh, there's this kind of simple yet nice idea that's been suggested, which is to add for like a given uh, level of, of uh, noising uh, t, to add some like renoising and denoising kind of steps in order to increase the correlation between y star and y uh, y c. And that indeed like actually works well in practice. And so what we what we show in this work is that this is actually a, a discretization scheme of Langevin dynamics. And I, I guess, yeah, maybe I don't have too much time to um, dive into this, but uh, you can indeed of this kind of repaint corrector step, you can simply do uh, Langevin dynamics in order to get your, uh, your ad for, so I guess in figure six, we have an illustration of this. So the predictor step, which is the one from the previous slide, would be this blue arrow where you're kind of like making a guess, you know, trying to remove one level of noise uh, uh, and you know approximate that, but you know because it's like approximate, you're discretizing things wouldn't be exact, so you'd be kind of offshooting the kind of true trajectory of your denoising process, and then this long run corrector would be this kind of this red arrow that's kind of like uh, you know projecting you back in some sense uh, onto this you know the true the true uh, level you know and true your your true kind of de conditional density of your stochastic process, um, and what we show what we observe kind of empirically is that you really need to do uh, some Langevin steps because if you have zero uh, on the y-axis, you have some kind of uh, measure of how good you're like fitting this conditional sample, and you need to do at least a couple of Langevin steps to to uh, yeah to match that efficiently. Um, okay, so yeah, is, is there any any question? Oh, okay, I'll, uh, okay, so I guess take like a few minutes to go through some ex experimental results that we uh, that we have. So first, we looked at like one D uh, kind of uh, data sets, so which you can see here in the first column, uh, where the first three are, are Gaussian processes, uh, and the last two are like non-Gaussian. Uh, and so then we train our, our model along like other uh, baselines that I'll show in the next slides. And here you can see in the middle column, like just samples from the kind of you know, unconditional uh, process, and then on the right column, right side column, uh, samples from the conditional process. And then we measure the predictive log likelihood, uh, and what we can see is, I guess, this, this model like, is able to, uh, you know, fit both Gaussian and non-Gaussian processes, as opposed, for instance, to like neural, uh, like some different uh, class of neural processes, which, uh, you know, work well relatively, like very well on, on Gaussian processes, but maybe not as well on non-Gaussian processes. Uh, for instance, on like this surplus or mixture data set. Um, and then on, the, on this bottom row, we do the kind of the same thing, but instead of like evaluating within the training range, we evaluate like outside of the training range. Yes. How do you evaluate yeah, so I skip all of this in a, because of uh, time constraints. But so I guess we basically just computing the log of the joint, so of both the variables, you know, y star and y c, and then we also computing the log of the conditional set, and then we subtracting these two. And you can, yeah, basically you can compute the probability flow of, of you know, the joint and, and this. Uh, yeah, it's kind of pretty similar otherwise in that regard. Um, yeah, and so here, you know, models that basically have no uh, uh, kind of like translation invariant uh, constraint, you know, wouldn't be able to like perform like in any way uh, well outside the training range. Um, but uh, such stationary uh, neural processes such as cons GP or GNP, uh, perform as well, and similarly for uh, this, uh, the model in blue, it performs as well in the, you know, outside the training range. Um, but this NDP star here is, like, is exactly the same model as the one in blue, it just does not have this translation uh, invariance constraints in the score network, and it basically like performs like really badly, that's why we didn't even uh, report the results, because kind of it's never been trained on that range, so there's no reason. So anyway, so that shows that basically this, this model like works well in Gaussian and non-Gaussian settings and can generalize having this like stationary assumption. So then we look at uh, 2D Gaussian vector fields. Uh, so with the candles that I've, I've uh, mentioned earlier. 
And uh, similarly, we can see this NDP star does not have, so neural diffusion process does not have uh, a group equivalence uh, constraint. And it works pretty well, nonetheless, uh, but not as well as the one in blue, which you know, we, we use like uh, an E2 equivalent uh, parameterization for the score network, where it's kind of like you know, matching exactly the predictive load likelihood of the data set. And I guess most maybe useful is that, uh, you know, although they perform both like relatively similarly, like the equivalent uh, uh, stochastic process uh, in orange can perform very well with like extremely few data points, uh, as opposed to the other one, which which has like requires like way way more data points to be able in some way to kind of learn this invariance property, uh, mm -hmm. because the orange one kind of like works on like a state space that's like way lower dimensionality, so you kind of like giving these head stars, this kind of massive head star. And, yeah? No, that's, that is true, yeah. Uh, no, that's, that's a fair point. Yeah, it's true that we should do that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's true that maybe this, yeah, but this is maybe a bit unfair, you're right. Uh, I guess, yeah, typically you would add some data augmentation. Uh, that's, that's a good point. So I guess, yeah, it wouldn't be as dramatic. Uh, and very, yeah, lastly, I guess, okay, I'll very skip that, but basically here we show, we look at like cyclone trajectories, uh, which are like, you know, we model as like being sample path, uh, you know, functions from like R to S2, so R being the time index and S2 being like a position on Earth. And we, we model this, this, uh, this data set, so you can see on the bottom left, um, like samples from the data set, on the bottom right, samples from our train model. And we basically built on like a prior work where we extend different models onto the ma manifold setting. Um, anyway, I guess yeah, in, I'll skip this. But uh, yeah, as a quick recap, uh, make sure everyone's kind of like have the, the key ideas is that we, the aim was to build a privacy model of a, a tensor fields or like you know, a collection of tensor fields, feature fields. Um, and so first we extended different models over function spaces by correlating, you know, all the finite marginals with some kind of kernel. And we also showed how we could incorporate a group invariant. And that's with two things. One, by targeting an invariant Gaussian process by using a, a group equivalent mean and kernel. And secondly, by uh, parameterizing the score network with also a group equivalent neural network. Uh, and then also I showed like, that the Langevin character was really key to be able to effectively sample from the conditional process. And uh, then, yeah, I guess I'll show like a few, a few examples on how like this class of models, because as opposed to like neural processes, doesn't have this diagonal uh, 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 predictive covariance structure. Uh, it, it's able to like really have like really good modeling capacity on both like scalar vector fields and with processes with a Euclidean and spherical uh, output. Uh, yeah, thanks for your attention. Uh, yeah, I guess if we have a bit of time for remarks, that's uh, lovely. And, uh, also, yeah, definitely looking forward to uh, uh, chat uh, with you uh, during this weekend to yeah, meet you. I see. So in the, so you would you would still noise the context, but you would uh, simulate the reverse probability flow for D in this step. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Okay, yeah, I guess if gamma. So, you so you use that equation for the likelihood of both, right? Yes. Yeah. So what would be kind of too big? Because in practice, like I mean, if all the problems I showed after, like even like a couple of thousands of steps wouldn't work so well. So that doesn't sound like a massive amount of step uh, of noise injecting each time, but uh, maybe it is still too much. Indeed, like that's that's a good point. Uh, okay, but then it gets fixed if you drop the deterministic part of the drift and just do like long long steps. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So adding long long, but no, but we we did actually uh, try both. Uh, that's a good point. Indeed, like reversing the property flow or the the time reversal, and uh, indeed the property flow works a bit better but still like with no kind of corrector, like it's still like kind of just, so 
that's that's a good point. It seems that it does help, but still, like with no character, basically, you get samples that are like yeah, basically very much not really conditioned on the context set. So they look good, but they kind of like tend to slightly ignore the, the context set. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's definitely. More questions? Yes? So on the score network. Um, so yeah, I guess indeed, I guess in the literature there's, yeah, it shows that. Although you kind of like, in some way already telling what's the kind of right function class, then it seems that it may have an impact on like the optimization problem, so it may be harder. Uh, so for the 1D setting, it's kind of, in some way we didn't change the architecture, we just kind of remove the center of mass of the data. So that's like, it's just a very simple trick to get a translation volume network. And for the second one, we use like a, uh, uh, like a kind of SC2 transformer kind of architecture, so it's like a, a graph base with like an uh, attention kind of idea. Uh, so I guess it's a bit hard to, because, yeah, I guess I'm not sure how I can specifically single out that, you know, it's, it's not easy to train because of this specific, because of the equivalence. For me, the issue was more like a, the fact that because it's like a graph based architecture, like, uh, it scales like doesn't scale so well with the number of uh, of you know inputs that you you want to model your stochastic process over. Um, so yeah, I didn't really notice any, like necessarily like instabilities or thing like this. It was more like instead of like memory uh, scalability. Uh, but I guess this is more like maybe the specific choice of like graph architecture. I guess they maybe are like smarter choice. I mean, if you work on the grid, then you yeah you wouldn't need to do that. But I guess the idea right of this stochastic process is that you'll be able to evaluate them anyway. Yes, I mean, uh, the follow-up question would be, uh, do you think the extra, I mean, and that's the question we always ask on this lecture about trying to import the variant, but the extra work seems to uh, actually be worth it. And, uh, and in your paper, you can comment on how much extra work you have to do to make it equivalent compared to training it on the augmented data. I see. Uh, and, and I guess, then, do you see that you are actually doing better in the mm. case if you are implementing the equivalence? Yeah, so, I guess it's true I didn't try, which is maybe a bit, a bit unfair and but silly. But you did, no, in your slide, you compared to the non-equivalent version. Oh, yeah, yeah, but I guess yeah. you didn't try like, uh, like with data augmentation, which maybe yeah. would be a bit of a more fair comparison, that is true. Uh, but no, so it does definitely, I mean, I guess here, like, I mean, ob obviously, since you're not trying the scale network on this kind of bottom modularization, like, outside of this kind of minus one, one range, there's no way it can work if you don't enforce, like, saturation but it's just like other neural process like also can do this like convolution kind of based neural processes. But also if you have like a GP that is stationary, you also model that. So here it's like really like just wouldn't work at all uh, otherwise. And here it doesn't really require any, it's just like, yeah, removing like the center of mass. So that's like doesn't really change anything. Uh, so that's like very easy. Uh, yeah. So, here, I guess, yeah, it, it does require like kind of like knowledge and has about how like to work with equivalent neural network, uh, which are a bit more tricky. Yeah, trickier because I guess you need to know a bit more about like uh, uh, represent, representations and yeah, how to implement them and, and such things. So yeah, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to tell. I mean, it's true I didn't evaluate on like data augmentation, but at least with all that, like it does, you know, I guess you're like cushioning out like a big part of the state space. Uh, so, I mean, this is a bit toy show. Something I'm, I'm working on uh, is like work, looking at like more like weather data with like wind direction and like temperature and pressure fields. So, I'd be interested to see like how well that works. And here, maybe this environment concern would be too strong because if you have, you know, if you're like modeling a specific, you know, if you, in some way you would kind of discount, you know, this is land, this is like sea. But uh, I think you could soften the equivalence by amortizing the score network with such kind of like topological, uh, I mean, like, or like geographical data, so you kind of have like a soft equivalence. Uh, but yeah, so that's something I, I, I'd like to try, I haven't really tried. So yeah, I don't think it's, it's necessarily worth it for every problem because it could be seen as like a pretty strong constraint in some instances, but others like you kind of know that you have that, or at least like partially you have this, and so then I think it does make sense uh, because then you can generalize better and train with less data. <laughs> Any more questions? 
So if not, I suggest we thank again the speakers of this session.